Okay, morning. Let's see if we can't get most of the way through this section so we can do at least a little bit on, on diving uh, on Thursday. But we left off with an introduction to the um, <coughs> models of altitude training. We talked about the hematological and non-hematological models. So this is uh, <coughs> trying to explain the mechanisms for why altitude exposure might work. And these are now methods of applying altitude exposure. So models of altitude training are um, live high, train low, live low, train high, the variations therein. And we'll go through each of them in, uh, in some amount of depth and try to figure out which is best. There is one that I think is best. We'll see if we can figure out which one is best. So being at altitude. There is a stress on the body with low PO2, carrying capacity needs to adapt, or perhaps buffering capacity or efficiency. And we know that just traveling to altitude compromises normal function. Your systems are set up optimally to work in the environment in which they've been trained or designed. So when you move to altitude, there's a lower exercise capacity, lower PO2, lower VO2 max, lower exercise capacity. But perhaps since you adapt to altitude normally, maybe exercise training at altitude would provide a greater stress and a greater stimulus for adaptation. So Acute performance is compromised, but maybe if you move to altitude and you start an exercise training program, or if you do it in hypoxic conditions, the stress of exercise coupled with the stress of low PO2 would allow you to train more, become trained more quickly, or train to a higher degree. It's possible. And this is probably one of the easiest approaches to altitude training because the exposure is usually fairly limited and it's often applied when you're exercising and that's it. So the hypoxic exposure lasts only as long as the exercise does and that requires um, there are machines called hypoxicators which are big pumps that filter out oxygen or modify the normal room air that allow you to breathe in a lower O2 air. Or you could take a giant gas tank, fill up a big bag, and then breathe from that rather than breathing from the room, which if we had more weeks in this semester, I'd set up for you over there. I have a giant 200-liter bag, and we can just use the Metcart calibration tanks and try to breathe that air in to see what the intermittent hypoxic stimulus would be. We have 12 weeks this semester, not 13, so we're a little bit limited. So we have prepared hypoxic gas or, or devices that filter oxygen. The upfront cost of the, the latter device is a, is a bit more expensive, but then they just work. It's a pump that just works. So usually, pretty easy to apply this, um, this type of hypoxic stimulus. And this is different... This is different from, have you seen those hypoxic masks? They used to be advertised on Facebook a lot, like training masks that look like Bane from Batman. You're supposed to increase hypoxia. It's, it's different than that. This is actual hypoxic training. That is just increase the work of moving air back and forth. So it's not that you're hypoxic. It's harder to move air in and out. But the air still has the normal... Uh, pressure and O2 content. It's just your lungs work harder to, uh, to move it in. So we can look at, um, there's, there's a general consensus that there are small, if any, effects of this type of training. And I think a really nice figure that sums it up is shown here. Live low, train high. Going about your daily business at sea level, but then just training with hypoxic gas, however you decide to apply it, 
says there's no real benefits, but most of these studies are small. They're not well controlled. Um, one of them that did try to get around that is shown here with a comparison of training in normoxia or training in hypoxia. So I'm trying to differentiate those two with the colored uh, rectangles for you. Six weeks of training with uh, normal room air at sea level, six weeks of training with hypoxic air, which ends up being about 15% O2, so a gas tank with 15% O2, but at sea level pressures, and then looking at how those training programs affected performance. We would hope or expect if this type of training were beneficial, that performance would go up both at sea level and in, um, in hypoxic conditions or at altitude. The, uh, the y-axes are acute tests. So the top bar, I'm overlaying the red here, this is an acute test in normal sea level air. So red and red is training at sea level, acute test at sea level. These overlapping ones are uh, acute at sea level and acute in hypoxic conditions. And then blue and blue on the bottom right is training in hypoxia, acute test in hypoxia. So the first thing that we observe from this is regardless of how you train, there is no effect on sea level performance. That is, um, there's, no, there's no added effect of training in hypoxia on sea level performance. Both groups over six weeks saw improvements in performance, which is training. That's exercise training. We would expect that in a normal situation. So not a very strong case to be made for hypoxic training yet. What's somewhat interesting is the bottom half of the figure, the bottom panels, there is some improvement in performance only during hypoxia when you spent six weeks training in a low O2 environment. And it's difficult to suggest that this is due to some physiological mechanism. I'm not showing you, but the, um, uh, the, the red blood cell count is modestly different, 3 versus 6% in the normoxic versus hypoxic condition. And while there's a, a modest edge towards the hypoxic training, we would fully expect if that edge were real, there would be an effect at sea level as well as at altitude. So we can't say that this effect is due to some physiological mechanism. I think it's probably just due to the repeated experience of being in hypoxia and having to train. That's a really stressful case. Being in a low O2 environment already, you start to hyperventilate and you're like, okay, your eyes start to go blurry a little bit, but then exercising on top of that you're pacing yourself. You don't know how long you can last, and so the acute stress of hypoxic exercise after six weeks of training in normal air might cause you to limit your performance a bit. You're used to it over here on the right. So maybe some, uh, some role for this type of, of training or type of exercise if you're going to the Olympics in Mexico City, for instance got competition at high altitudes. Maybe you want to practice or train for that situation. Go ahead. But as far as improving sea level performance, there's no convincing case to be made for live low, train high. But what if 15% um, O2 isn't enough of a stimulus? We have a lot of control over uh, this type of training. It's, it's fairly inexpensive. You can order gas tanks with different concentrations of, of O2 in it. So why not a more accentuated version of this training? Instead of live low, train high, this would be intermittent hypoxia, which is characterized by short, severe bursts of exposure, usually mimicking about 6,000 meters. So this is high altitude exposure for brief periods of time. This is moving to Everest Base Camp in a second. This is really abrupt. But maybe 
that abruptness is going to cause or trigger larger adaptations. It's more of a shock that requires an adaptation by the body. And we observe very strong hyperventilatory responses, like when you move to altitude, of course, you start to hyperventilate, the SNS is activated. We see some reduction in PO2 in the blood, so where it's normally 100 millimeters of mercury, it drops, but not enough to really compromise saturation. Thanks to that flat portion of the hemoglobin curve, on the right, we can go through a wide range of PO2s before saturation drops. And so even this severe exposure has hyperventilatory consequences, but as far as SAO2 goes, saturation that would stimulate HIF-1, cause a bunch of adaptation responses, that's minimal. It seems that the, the stimulus is relatively minimal. We want saturation to be lower to require or invoke a large adaptation. And if we carry this out, there have been a few studies. I'm not going to show them, them here. Multiple controlled studies show there's no effect on VO2 max. There's no time trial performance effects. And it's really hard to justify doing any more research in this area. It's pretty conclusive that this type of... Uh, exposure doesn't do much. And so why put subjects through this uh, situation? It's ethically irresponsible, perhaps, to, uh, to uh, impose this stress on them. There's really no effect of this intermittent hypoxia. Not sure why. It is an added stress. The stress might not, not be large enough. Or perhaps the stress is too large that the exercise that you can do is compromised. It's like going for a brisk walk instead of going for a really hard uh, few hill climbs on your bike. Maybe it's not enough exercise because the stress is too large. Not sure. Either way, not an appealing method of applying altitude to um, improve sea level performance. Live low, train high. Not very, uh, not very effective for sea level performance. What might be um, effective for sea level performance is the classic training camp approach of live high, train high. This is traditional altitude training. It's usually done by groups of athletes here, a soccer team moving to altitude to prepare for a situation where they'll be competing in that environment. But that presents an important caveat any effects observed in this type of situation might be due to living and training at altitude, but they might be due to the intensive training camp approach of these training camps. The camaraderie, the um, getting up early, continued training, regimented eating, probably you're in a bubble in, in, this, uh, in this type of approach usually. And this requires physically moving to altitude. Live high, train high is, is not something that you can easily manipulate technologically. There are cases we'll look at where you can make um, a room hypoxic. You can, you can bring altitude to sea level briefly. But a group of individuals living and training at altitude requires <clears throat> generally them to displace to altitude. And so that requires its own set of resources, a lot of money, a lot of time. Uh, you have to have a place to go to. And as such, it's really hard to include a sea level control. If you're investing so much money in moving a group to altitude, it's difficult to include a group that stays at sea level and does nothing. It feels like while this presents a good scientific control, it feels like the money and the resources are wasted on something that you already know how it works. You know how training at sea level works. And so the comparison, though we need it to be rigorous, doesn't really seem to be viable from a grant writing and a research perspective. Live high, train high really came to light after the, uh, the Mexico Olympics and the East Africans started to dominate the field as far as uh, marathons and endurance events went. They are known to live and train at high altitudes. 
Um, there's a whole host of reasons we've tried to decipher for their, their dominance in those events. National pride is a big one. Some of their uh, dietary issues are another. Altitude might be uh, an important third. Um, one, one study that did find some benefits, I'm just briefly outlining here, and we'll look at um, a counterpoint to this on the next slide. But there is some suggestion, this is a, an interesting case study, not meant to do with sport performance per se, but this is in police officers finding robust uh, cardiorespiratory and um, exercise performance improvements in a group of officers at moderate altitude. 2,000 meters was what we would call moderate altitude as we uh, defined it at the start of the section. And so live high, train high has, it seems to confer some advantage, at least in a select population. Again, no control. We don't know if simply these individuals were unfit and if they started to exercise, of course, VO2 max and run performance went up. Um, when we try to apply a control, we remove any benefit of that live high, train high paradigm. <coughs> Most of the studies have been like that uh, single one that we mentioned before. You observe a group going to altitude, staying there, training there, and there's benefits. Sure, exercise makes you perform better. The, um, the, the intensive live-in-a-bubble experience might make you um, perform better, have better dietary habits. But when you compare altitude and sea level exposure, here is an... Uh, um, a crossover randomized design where we have group one and group two. Group one is at sea level first, followed by altitude. Group two is the opposite. Altitude very similar to the last study. And um, I'm just going to draw a, a random delineation on this graph to show you the, the bottom graph are the uh, altitude values. VO2 max measured at altitude. VO2 max measured at sea level are typically on top. There is separation between them because, yes, when you move to altitude, PO2 is lower. We know VO2 max decreases. What we're, um, we're looking at here is not the, the difference between the altitude situations, but how it changes in response to being in that situation. So... If there's an effect of live high, train high, we would expect there to be some improvement in VO2 max after the study was done. And we see neither group in response to being at altitude and training at altitude shows any discernible difference in VO2 max compared to the pre-exercise or pre-trial values. So this ends up being... What is it, like seven weeks? Yeah. Seven weeks. Three or four weeks in each case. The sea level individuals that move to altitude, when they come back down, your VO2 max is lower. There is no benefit of that paradigm in training, for sure. The altitude individuals that uh, trained there first and then came to sea level for the last three or four weeks, no improvement in VO2 max, same as the, the pre-training values. So the stimulus did not potentiate any effect of training. There's no improvement in VO2 max. There's no effect on performance, not shown here. Um, and what's interesting to consider Live high, train high, if we're, we're expecting to see effects of, the, um, of that stimulus on work capacity, on exercise performance, what we would like to see is specifically in group two, after they move to altitude and they're training at altitude and we see maybe even arguably a slight improvement in VO2 max, what we would expect is if there are adaptations here that carry over, we'd expect when they come back down to sea level, some adaptation at altitude might allow them 
to exercise at a higher intensity or to potentiate the training benefits at altitude after that exposure. But there doesn't seem to be any carryover. There's no machinery, there's no stimulus, there's no reason to expect that there's any added benefit of having been at altitude by looking at just these VO2 max values. There's no what I call potentiation of sea level training. Their VO2 max values aren't increasing or decreasing. They're pretty uh, stable. They are similar to the control condition where group one uh, was at sea level initially. So there's no difference having been at altitude and coming back down to sea level on performance or the ability to, uh, to train. So single point studies seem to present some benefit of live high, train high inside of the training camp mentality, but doing a crossover study doesn't show much difference versus a group that, uh, that stays at sea level. There's no difference in their um, performance after the intervention. This is controversial. There are a couple studies that um, try to suggest otherwise. But um, the majority say no consensus. I do want to present one possible, um, one possible mechanism or one possible adaptation that we do consistently observe, but that doesn't seem to connect to performance, which is somewhat interesting. So these are uh, swimmers at a training camp at altitude, live high, train high, versus swimmers at sea level. And right now we're looking at hemoglobin mass. So if we subscribe to the hematological model, carrying capacity needs to adapt, hemoglobin needs to increase in order for us to better um, tolerate altitude or for us to carry over altitude benefits to sea level. And you're looking at individual data over the course of a four-week training camp, and then we have a, a debrief, week one or week two post-training camp. And the difference, there's, there's a difference over here on the right. The, the training camp is, um, the data is a composite of two different studies. The open circles are from a three-week exposure, not four, and the closed circles are from four but they're just lining them all up together to give a combined, uh, a combined view. Not the cleanest study design, uh, but perhaps it might be easier to draw your attention to the average data in the middle. The dashed lines with the triangles are the, uh, the mean or the average data of all individuals in the sea level or the live high, train high groups. And it looks even with this scattered data, that there is a benefit for live high, train high to increase hemoglobin mass. There's a 6% increase that we can measure that's undeniable and no change in the sea level group. There's a similar, um, or there's, there's an increase in hemoglobin, but similar VO2 max. And we observe this change in hemoglobin fairly often with live high, train high, the, the stimulus to increase carrying capacity. But this is an interesting study because it disconnects that increase in hemoglobin from any whole body or functional changes. So with a higher carrying capacity, you'd expect right away improved VO2 max. Not the case. There's difference on an individual basis, absolutely, but the mean data before versus the debrief afterwards, no change in VO2 max, regardless of this improvement in uh, hemoglobin mass. And this is at the peak value where uh, hemoglobin would be its highest. So no change in VO2 max, but there's a tendency for performance to benefit. Overall, the message here seems to be quite muddled. There's no statistical significance in maximum swim speed or in 3,000 meter swim performance, there's a tendency for the live high, train high group to improve both of those performance metrics. So the, the maximum swim speed went up or, or tended to go up. The p-value is 0.051. Had it been 0.002 lower, we would have said, oh, there's a significant finding. 
but because we define that threshold initially, it's a somewhat moral gray area. We say there's a tendency or a trend for an improvement. And even the 3,000-meter uh, swim performance does seem to go up. P of 0.09 suggests there's something here. It might be simply underpowered, but we can't say for sure, hey, there's an effect of this paradigm. Really interesting to notice, though, there's a tendency for improved performance. There's a higher hemoglobin mass. No effect on VO2 max. So is VO2 max an appropriate measure to make to uh, quantify the changes in response to an altitude stimulus? No change in VO2 max, but changes in performance. I think performance is probably the more operative variable. Not the cleanest study. It's a bit patchwork. Uh, if you dig in a bit deeper, the live high, train high group also had a higher fat-free mass. So they had higher muscle mass and lower body fat. And so maybe that helps them uh, consume more oxygen or that's a reason for their improved performance. Who's to say? Um, but some inkling that there might be something here. It's just not conclusive. So maybe... Instead of live high, training high, being a paradigm that confers a, a training benefit, maybe it provides the opportunity to get a benefit. Maybe this live high, train high paradigm provides the opportunity to train. And we see that, uh, this is the U.S. Olympic training facility in Denver. We see that with um, some really high-level athletes that train here regularly. And uh, the scientists on staff do informal observational studies when, when presented with the ability and the, the, the setup to do that. Here we have two different blocks, 14 days of live high, train high blocks where the athletes are coming to the training center to um, get ready to compete at altitude. Uh, there are sea level workloads interspersed in between. There are um, hyperoxic, uh, hyperoxic sea level workloads done at the, the, uh, the training center here to try to give them that extra training stimulus. And these two 14-day blocks are interspersed by actual competition. So these elite runners come here to train. They train at altitude. They work with sea level workloads, and then they go to compete. And the competition provides an idea of how effective this training was at improving performance. So sea level workloads is key here, and I think the elite runners at the Olympic level are really the only ones that could probably withstand or allow training at sea level workloads. Five of six runners in this study uh, perform personal bests. Overall, there are four and five percent improvements in running performance after blocks one and two, so it, uh, it persists over time. Here again, we're uh, faced with the idea that there's no control to say, okay, we have elite runners that are also exercising in California at sea level. And if they're exercising at this intense sea level type workload, are they going to improve their performance, set personal bests? We're not sure. We're not sure if, there's, um, if this is an effect specifically at altitude, but there's a case here to be made that perhaps the opportunity is given by being at altitude and training at a really high level. Um, that's one point that I, that I forgot to bring up previously. So I just want to go back to this graph really quickly and mention that at altitude, while training, training here was done at the same relative percent of VO2 max. So you or I going to exercise would say, okay, let's exercise at 65% of VO2 max. At sea level, you're exercising at 65% of 4.6 liters per minute. At altitude, you're exercising at 65% of 4 liters per minute. That workload is lower at altitude. Same relative workload means lower absolute exercise intensity. That's one of the big criticisms of, of these types of studies. When you move to altitude and you start to exercise, you can't exercise as hard. 
I mean, I can't. Some of you might be able to. Maybe you're, you're, you're driven high-level athletes. These guys can. Elite-level Olympic runners that move to altitude are training at sea level workloads. So despite the pain and discomfort, their training load is, it feels harder. It's relatively higher. It's increased in this situation. So maybe that is the reason for these personal bests and the overall perf uh, improvement in performance. Not the altitude, but that the stress was greater. Live high, train high is probably one of the hardest um, paradigms to piece together a message for. There's really no consensus. Some groups move up and they see big improvements. The few well-controlled studies show no major effect, especially when you consider the, uh, the relative workloads of those groups at altitude. There's no control groups to say, had we not applied altitude, this is what would have happened. Therefore, the effect of altitude is dot, dot, dot. There's no, there are few control groups to be able to say that, which are the methodological concerns. And then we're trying to work together piecemeal to say, how do the changes in hemoglobin mass fit in? How do they relate to changes in workload? We don't see any improvements in aerobic capacity, but there might be some effect of altitude on performance. Is it experiential? They're used to exercising at altitude like we proposed on the last set of slides. Is it that the higher workloads, if you are a committed Olympic athlete, cause a greater stress and that allows you to, uh, to adapt? Or is it a placebo effect? Is it that you know you're in the cream of the crop, an elite group, you're chosen to go to training, uh, training, training camp, and you feel like you should be able to perform better? That's entirely possible as well. No consensus. It's rather muddy. And I'd say, if anything, the lack of consensus suggests that there's no real effect of live high, train high that we've yet to observe anyways. It's also really hard to blind the individuals. You know that you're at altitude, you know, you, you know you're in a training camp, and there's that whole element to uh, bring into play as well. What's a lot easier to characterize is a, a hybrid model that allows you to Typically, exercise in, con in controlled conditions or bring altitude down to sea level and shows relatively robust, consistent improvements. Live high, train low mm -hmm. is uh, the newest of these paradigms, and it seems to really provide the, the biggest punch. It still causes a physiological adaptation because you're exposed to altitude, but we alleviate the conflict with trying to select appropriate workloads. By training at sea level, there's no guesswork in saying, is the workload too easy or not? Can we convince these people to work at sea level workloads while they're at altitude or not? They're at sea level. They work at their normal exercise pace. So this is uh, relatively new and we are able to study this so easily because we uh, can use the same types of equipment that we proposed for the intermittent hypoxic training or live low train high to apply altitude artificially, quote unquote artificially, to individuals at sea level. There's general consensus and now what we're looking at is how the individual response um, varies. And I'll show you what the consensus is. I'll show you a bit of the, uh, the variation. But this is where we get our message for if altitude works, how long do you need to be there? How high do you need to go? And what effect can you expect? So this is most convenient, most robust, and generally agreed upon method of um, 
applying altitude in your training program. So live high, train low. Live high, train low. Could involve living at altitude and driving down the mountain, like one study that we'll look at. Or could involve using um, an artificial environment like the one shown here. And the easiest way to, uh, to apply that artificial environment, the live aspect can be taken a bit loosely. There's some interpretation there. A lot of individuals at sea level will interpret live as sleep in. Spend the majority of your day in um, a low altitude tent, so to speak. And depending on how much money you want to spend and what facilities you have at your disposal, there are a few ways to apply this stimulus. So in a situation like this that we're viewing um, in the background, this would be more of an artificial live high, train low stimulus. Artificial being pressure is the same. Pressure is still sea level pressure. This is just flexible plastic. But low O2 gas is being pumped in. So hypoxia is being instituted at normal pressures, which would compromise PO2 and cause adaptations accordingly. This is called artificial hypoxia or artificial um, altitude training. The natural form requires that pressure also changes. Pressure drops which decreases PO2 and causes the, uh, the stimulus to adapt. But changing pressure requires that you have the equipment that can sustain or withstand that pressure gradient. Imagine you've got really low pressure in here. What happens? The air wants to rush in, so the walls collapse inwards. You need well-sealed, generally uh, metal, plexiglass, plastic, something that's fairly hard, so a dedicated room to be able to achieve this natural form of, uh, of hypoxia at sea level. Requires a much bigger investment up front and dedicated space. It's not portable like something like this is. This can move around with you. You pack it in a bag, take it to your hotel, and live in your hypoxic chamber. Despite making this distinction, both are pretty much the same. You can still calculate the inhaled PO2. You can still set that. Partial pressure of oxygen is just the percent oxygen of the total atmospheric pressure. You can titrate those to achieve the PO2 of, uh, that you desire. Both are equivalent. They've not been compared directly. There's really no reason to. Probably one of the most comprehensive studies to evaluate the paradigms together is uh, this one by Levine and Stray Gunderson, which are names that you'll see a lot in this field if you're interested. You can search for them in Google Scholar. They have a series of, uh, of studies uh, based out of Texas. This is a multi-center approach where they, uh, they had a group in Texas, they had a group in Utah that were living high, training high, a group in Utah that uh, lived high with that, that, that first group and then drove half an hour to Salt Lake City to train at quote unquote low levels and then uh, another control in California at sea level the live low train low group and you can see the altitude shown here in the schematic makeup for the study moderate altitude at 2500 meters just like we uh, prescribed at the start of the section train low certainly isn't low it's lower but it's still 1,250 meters. It's not sea level by any means, but it's what, um, what they could work with at altitude. You're in the mountains, you don't get to sea level in half an hour at the drop of a hat, typically. So three groups, live high, train high, live high, train low, live low, train low. There's no live low, train high group here because like we mentioned, it's, it's generally considered an ineffective stimulus and there's not much reason to study it because there's conclusive evidence that it doesn't really work. So multi-center study, similar individuals, a nice lead-in period at sea level, the intervention here over four weeks, and then a debrief over three weeks afterwards, measuring performance 
over those three weeks to see how long the, uh, the effects persisted. One of the, the most comprehensive studies. And so we want to see which of these paradigms is best, and we want to investigate how the live low, train high paradigm affected the physiology of these individuals. So in each of these groups, you've got low, low, high, low, and high, high <clears throat> in three columns. And there's really only an effect on red cell mass and hemoglobin. Again, expecting that the hematological model is, uh, is central to these adaptations in the high-low and the high-high groups. So we're getting some sense here that maybe there is a high-high training camp type effect. Maybe that paradigm is effective in, um, in adapting and, and maintaining performance. We certainly see it in the high-high group and now in the high-low group. These two groups at the end of the four weeks of altitude exposure showed significant improvements in red cell mass and hemoglobin. Sig uh, significant and similar increases. Now, does that do anything? Are those functional improvements? Well, even though we can divorce or we've seen suggestions that red cell mass doesn't necessarily confer benefits in oxygen uptake, that's still something that we want to measure and see if aerobic capacity goes up. And just like the red cell mass and the hemoglobin changes, the high-high and the high-low groups show pretty nice responses in VO2 max to those stimuli. So altitude training, living high, training high, or living high, training low, showing comparable improvements in VO2 max, which is encouraging. And the live uh, high, train low group starts a bit lower, maybe it's a bit steeper, but I'm highlighting it here for you because that's the group of interest in this section. VO2 max does not mean performance. What are other measures of performance that we can look at? The ability to sustain a high VO2, the ability to sustain race pace might be reflected in maximal steady state VO2. This is VO2 at ventilatory threshold. Another word to, or another way to describe it. This is the highest VO2 that you can maintain in an endurance type capacity that you might be able to hold on to for a couple hours. And again, um, some improvements initially in these groups, but we start to see separation. The live high train low group, the only group to respond positively in this regard. They're able to, uh, to maintain a higher VO2 after training and both of the other groups. It's still not a performance metric. How does performance change? Here, 5K performance. I'm not showing you the graph. I'm just going to overlay the main finding. 5K performance time decreased in the high-low group, live high, train low. And that was the only group to show improvements in 5K time. Lower numbers, faster performance. They completed the 5K faster. 12 to 15 seconds faster compared to the live high, train high group. That's uh, no real change, but six or eight seconds slower performance. And the live low, train low group, I don't know what they were doing in California, probably not exercising, 30 seconds slower 5K time by the end of the trial. <clears throat> So, trying to decipher these results, we see the physiological basis for performance improve in both altitude groups. And that results in an improvement in VO2 max in both altitude groups, but for some reason, only the live high, train low group improved actual performance. The... Um, aerobic VO2 that, that they can maintain, the highest aerobic VO2 they can maintain, and 5K time only went up in the live high, train low group, not in live high, train high, and not in live low, train low. It's possible that the, what I'm immediately drawn to are, is this separation right here. 
It's possible live high, train low is just a better stimulus. Better um, adaptation because the, the train low half of the paradigm means higher, um, higher exercise stress, better adaptation. Maybe it's just a better stimulus. Maybe the groups aren't randomized as well as we thought, though. It really looks like the live high, train low group was a bit less fit. It's two mils per kg is not a lot, and it's not significant because the error bars are so large. But I wonder if these individuals are more susceptible to improvement. Maybe. You, um, you put an individual with a low fitness uh, on a training program, and the initial improvements are always quite large. Percentage-wise, <coughs> big improvements. And these aren't untrained individuals by any means, but maybe there's some enhanced sensitivity. They improve more during the lead-in. And, and note, there's no difference in any part of the study during this first four-week period. All groups are at sea level. All groups are doing the same exercise. This is the lead-in to get them to the same fitness level. Live high, train low is already responding more. Maybe they're more sensitive. I'm not sure. Not something you can predict before getting into the study, but something to, that, that's worth considering. We'll put it that way. <clears throat> Maybe there's a bias in the group selection. But not to be too critical, it does seem... Like, performance was improved across the board in that group over the other two groups. And this is a combined plot showing change in VO2 max and change in time trial performance. And maybe not obviously, but not a linear relationship. VO2 max improvements do not mean uh, an improvement in performance. There's a general trend going up, but there's a lot of scatter. So anyone to the right of this vertical dashed line saw an improvement in VO2 max. Anyone above this horizontal dashed line showed an, an improvement. This is improvement in 5K time. Even though the number is higher, this is improvement in 5K time. I always have to wrap my mind around that. Improvement in 5K time. It would be faster. The time spent running 5K would be shorter. This is delta, or improvement in 5K time. Um, the high-low group, I'm going to highlight the band where most of them are present. The high-low group with the best changes overall on the last slide all tended to see an improvement in 5K time. They're all stuck within this green band. The high-high group tended to see an improvement in 5K performance. But there's a few that really didn't respond well, where their performance went down. And that weights the average to just below even. Um, no real change of performance for that group when you look at the, the average, the overall. But generally, it's shifted towards the top, certainly more so than the train, or live low, train low group. It gets a bit messy, but that spans all the way from the bottom to the, uh, the 0.5 mark on the y-axis. That group is all scattered in here, certainly below the, um, the horizontal dashed line. So majority of the high-low participants saw an improvement in performance. Didn't even really seem to matter that uh, VO2 max was somewhat higher or lower. The, the paradigm seems to be really potent, for better or for worse. Let's take a quick break here. We'll digest this. I'm going to talk about some, um, some genetic links, and then we'll look at uh, a fourth paradigm that wasn't initially included in our, in our list that may or may not show some, uh, some benefits for exercise training. So we'll come back to that in a second.